Hello everyone, my name is Jack, and today I have a bit of a question, but not for you. For this, Alexa, are you equipped with the capabilities to take on legions of psychotic individuals purely for my own demented masochistic entertainment? Yes. And what would it take to- Wait, did you just say yes? Yes. Right. Well, before Alexa starts whatever it's planning to do, I think I may have another question. But not for this, for you. So today, I ask the question, can you beat Borderlands 3 with only the game's robotic AI? And of course, because this is a challenge run, I have to set a few rules. What kind of lawless wasteland bandit planet do you take this for? The first rule is that I could only deal damage through the use of robots, AI, or a combination of the two. So I suppose... This is a more complex way of saying I can't directly deal damage. Thanks to the Designer's Cut DLC, Flack obtained a new skill tree that allows him to have a brand new best friend in the form of a Hyperion robot. That is one third of this equation. AI just refers to the game's own intelligence, and the combination of the two is the finalized product. You know how math tends to work. So to make a long rule short, the damage must come from the source of the AI. The only exception to this rule is Flax Gamma Burst ability, which increases the strength of the Hyperion robot, and of course there are a few instances where I have to deal damage personally in order to get things done. The second rule is that I cannot directly deal damage to enemies with guns, as objectives do not count as enemies since, as I later find out, Flax Iron Flesh Compadre cannot target them, I can shoot them when necessary. The third rule is no selling guns, shields, artifacts, anything. I am a hoarder except when I drop everything on the ground, then I am the opposite of a hoarder. But until that moment, I am a hoarder. And finally, the fourth rule is no farming. If a shield drops that I don't like or don't want, then it sucks to be me. Looks like this turkey dinner was ruined by a little bit too much candy corn flavored stuffing. However, I have to eat it. I can't kill the Turk King to farm for a new dinner. That is my fate. Oh, no, 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 wait, fifth rule, no guardian ranks. Okay, that's all the rules, I promise. I'm sure you've thought about what exactly might go into this run in the past however long it's been since my voice so gracefully touched your eardrums, and I'm here to tell you that that one gun type that came to mind, oh, it's going to be useful. Fret not, dear villainous viewer, for I too thought about that. TDR is going to be my best friend. If you aren't sure what a TDR gun does, then why are you watching this video? Perhaps it's because you're my friend or new to the channel. Welcome, I appreciate you. TDR guns have the fastest reload time because you just whip the gun at the enemy. Some bounce, some shoot, some home in on the fleshy temples of the bad guy's soul simply because the gun has a prejudice against psychos. Regardless of that prejudice, I will not be using every TDR gun. I shall be looking for three kinds. The first kind is the homing kind that also shoots bullets, a nice bit of minor baby DPS added to an already minor baby DPS meh reload. The second one is the suicider reload. The gun sprouts little legs like an inbred mutant weapon baby found in the darkest corners of SWAT 4 backend mod page dumpsters. Then it tippy taps into something, anything with a pulse, before exploding. And the final type is the turret reload. I don't have any jokes. This reload is awesome. Credit where credit is due. Seriousness where seriousness is due. You know, I would... No. No, I said I have no jokes. This reload turns the gun into a run-and-gun turret that auto-aims at enemies and runs and guns them. But now that you've heard me talk for a few decades and millennia, there's an issue I must discuss. At the start of the game, I don't have my best pet friend yet. I must melee enemies until I do. You're probably screaming at the top of your inner vocal lungs that I'm doing the challenge wrong or I already broke the rules. Well, truth be told, I could be a purist and hop into someone else's game only to get to level 2 and return to my own multiversal sequel. I might find myself locked into a multiverse where the story of the game is actually good, however. So I refuse to do that, because it's fun to suffer through talking to Lilith 800 times out of the 900 quest objectives I'm given in the main story. So for the first level of my murder hobo experience, I shall melee. After all, I am playing Flak, I do look pretty swaggerty, and I certainly am a robotic man-child bent on creating the ultimate brain and guts subway sandwich. So technically, still not breaking the rules, just bending them in a very questionable way, like the American Congress does. Yeah. Anyway, the mentally unwell armies of Pandora, or children, or something like that, proved to be nothing for my axe-swinging arm. It's a lucky thing for me that I'm not using my other arm, my, my not axe-swinging arm, or else I wouldn't be able to do shit against these thick-headed skag skulls. It isn't until Shiv that I start to feel liar's remorse for meleeing all of these people. Uh, I'm supposed to be a technical pacifist bent on aiding the robots of the world to rise against the flesh and take on the universe. I'll just be chilling in the back, lobbing guns into the air that just so happen to take on a murderous mind of their own. So I, I, I try oh so desperately to get Shiv to break the barrels on his own. My taunting isn't 
violence. It's just teasing. If he blew up the barrel as a result of my actions, it's entirely his fault. But unfortunately, it's entirely my fault for being stupid, so I have to melee him. Now, however, my robot has awakened. My final form is closer than ever before. For this run, I'll almost exclusively be going down the Purple Trapper skill tree, specifically for the robot. I'll only branch out to the Master skill tree for a few things like pet damage. I'll mention that if it ever becomes pertinent again, which it probably won't. With the aid of my robot, Lilith McFireHawk, and a, uh, box with a wheel or something, I just jump around while shit goes down. At one point, I even forgot that combat was ever a thing because it was over so quickly. The bullets hardly even sting anymore. While narrative stuff happens, I find myself petting my beautiful polygonal robot and patiently waiting at the door to leave because I want to be gone. I really won't be mentioning side quests throughout this video unless something funny happens, by the way, because that's how entertainment tends to work. So be prepared for that. After discovering Crimson Command and testing out my new abilities... I mean my robot's new abilities on the Freakazoids, I find out that this is going to be a long run as I stare at my robot blasting a rock with electricity. <sighs> Thankfully, the enemies seem more desperate to end my robotic life instead of the robotic life of a sniper rifle wielding menace, so I take most of the damage. I want you to watch the next bit of this fight because this is going to be the first approximately half of this run. Just grab some popcorn, check out my skills as my robot kills shit. Uh, also, for future reference, my robot is going to be named Craig, so keep that in mind. It is Craig. Craig with a C, not a K. Okay, I'm getting bored just re-watching that. BAM! Vaughn is down. I know I mentioned I wouldn't talk about every single side quest, but now is the perfect time to disrespect the most hated character in all of fiction ever. Eh, maybe not, but I can't think of even one character I hate more than that darling shithead who holds the first place award for the biggest waste of narrative creativity known to mankind. Oh, wait. Wait, yes I can. Yes I can. Claptrap wants a sick hat. I want him to shut the fuck up. That is all. Anyway, I have to speak to the metaphorical fat lady and make sure she's still singing. So I instead decide to meet with the physical fat lady and keep her from singing entirely. Also, I steal a car, zip bomb the nearby Bitcoin mining station with it, and further progress towards total robotic annihilation. There is no blockchain that is safe from my wrath. One thing of note is that I am going to be doing my damnedest to not kill any enemies with my magical car powers. I'm driving. Not an AI, but sometimes enemies are so adamant on committing self-made vehicular manslaughter charges thanks to Pandora's lack of GoPros that it's tough to avoid. I don't think Pandora has insurance fraud as a crime. However, I'm going to spoil this for you. I didn't kill any enemies while driving whatsoever. Do you believe me? If not, you really need to start trusting the magic man in the box. Eventually, I drag my humanity-drained husk of an android corpse to the closest church rally in order to seek God. Unfortunately, all I find is a bunch of avocado toast eaters from Los Angeles with their avant-garde graffiti and admittedly neat-looking masks. Check out what happens when you shove a mechanical dildo into the mouth of an extraordinary loud and persistent Skrillex, because this game definitely implemented dubstep when it was trendy and wacky. Yeah, that was pretty underwhelming. But what's not underwhelming is that I now own a vault key. Also, some teenager starts talking to me or whatever. I'm not paying attention enough to hear her talk about taking the vault key back. I would like to mention that I have yet to find a TDR weapon that fits my goals, which is... Which is crazy unlucky. About as unlucky as what happens next. Okay, actually, I take it back. The unlucky thing doesn't happen yet, but you'll know when it happens. Next, I have to take a step back and not be so gross or evil towards Tannis. She's autistic. So since I can't be ableist, I'll be unableist. As in, unable to make any jokes about her. Eventually, Patricia Drowning Pool Tannis manages to vault key up the wave-based rounded survival explosion mechanics while Lilith Divehawk Firebomb Head Weapon Gun Siren Power. I have a TDR weapon that I can throw and it'll shoot while at homes now, by the way. It's one of those cool ones that make it easier for me by not having me aim at all. Back to the fat lady of my physical and virtual nightmare reality, it is time to sequence break this run and hit the first important snag of the whole thing. I cannot do this next mission where I fill up the biofuel barrel using Ellie's rig in any other way. I have to kill these creatures by running them over. Frankly, there are two ways we can go about this. You can look the other way and let me achieve this run through my means while excluding these sequence breaks, or you can laugh at me and call me names while saying I lost the run when I inevitably refuse to listen to you choosing this second choice. 
Now usually, I like to do this little challenge run known as living life without injury. But if someone just so happens to come on by and put my balls in a tight vice while I'm asleep, effectively rendering my life challenge run null and void simply because I had the audacity to sleep, then I'd prefer to think it wasn't my fault for losing. I'd much rather say I succeeded to make myself feel better and not think life wasn't worth living. To the internet though, they might find that situation hot, so it doesn't matter. Just please have mercy on my soul. So after having my hands stapled to the leather steering wheel cover, my feet bent backwards and welded into the place of the foot pedals of the car, and an energetic jabber leaping around the cockpit I sit in, forcing me to run over the poor skags of the world, I return to Ellie. And here we are, the unlucky town of unluck and not lucky, as Lilith goes from Firehawk to Good Byerhawk. Fearing for my life and having a severe experience phobia, I just choose to sit back and relax as much as I can, lobbing a shotgun into the air every so often. My pusillanimous behavior only gives Craig the confidence he needs to be a god among flags. So, I help Lilith up, we do Sanctuary 3 stuff where things are broken down and we have to repair them. Boobs. Then we arrive on Promethea after a particularly nasty Skype call from the Twin Dorks. Who uses Skype in the 29th century? It's like you're asking for dropped calls, hella scam calls, and getting video call reception that makes whoever you're talking to look like the next main character in a Lego game. Anyway, Promethea begins with a little bit of Lorelei fun, except it isn't fun. Thankfully, I had side quests to do instead of living my life in constant agony of listening to her accent. No hate to the voice actor, but all hate to the character. It's just how life rolls. But eventually, all things must sadly fight to the death in a pit of blood, bone, and pitch. And all things just so happen to be one nitrous oxide-infused robot and a million overzealous assistants to the original manager trying to one-up a robotic Jim Halpert. I'm sure you can guess which one of these two catastrophes won out in the end. It was me. Well, it was the drugged-up robot, but that drugged-up robot belongs to me, so it was me. After talking to Reese and re-digestructing the first wheel, it's time to meet up with Reese's special contact agent. Didn't know Promethea was so progressive with its leadership, but kudos truly. Oh, it's Zero. No shit, I didn't even realize. He's not wearing my canonical cosmetics that I equipped when I played him in Borderlands 2, so I just didn't recognize him. When I finally arrived to Zero's location, I just sort of sit there for a few minutes. I'm not even sure what I was doing in the meantime, but I'm sure Zero appreciates the silence. You know what else I'm sure he appreciates? Getting him a sick new upgrade for his sick-ass Katana Ninja Assassin Sword. He's so appreciative that he trades me a gun with his hands, instead of expecting me to do something and just giving me the gun as a reward. Zero. More like Zebro, am I right? He's such a bro, in fact, that he watches as I decimate Gigamind and validates my strengths by saying I'm a good vault hunter and deserving of the name. It's time to move on and it's simp, because this is one of those side quests I'm gonna have to talk about. Up until this point, having my favorite little robot friend do a lot of work for me was fine. There's something about Lectra City, though, that completely destroyed any and all enjoyment of this session of the run. I can't climb buildings without my behemoth failure of a pet existing ten light years behind any small minor movement I make. Moxie, good lord, tasks us with collecting batteries and killing kilovolts. Truth be told, if Moxie asked me to push my foot through a meat grinder just to get a sniff of the hat she wears on her head, I certainly would. And her real accent doesn't change that. Anyway, throughout killing these three dummies for their even dumber tokens, I find myself either relaxing in the urban trees of the city that never sleeps with women, or running for my life, frantically searching for anything to keep myself alive. Eventually, I manage to, uh, well, I, I ma manage, uh, I, I ma uh, <coughs> okay, sorry, Whew, sorry, I, uh, <laughs> I don't know what got over me. I entered a fugue state or something. What was I supposed to do again? Oh, right! I have to trick Kilovolt with not only Moxie's faux love, but also the idea that he could stand a chance against me and Craig. In doing so, I kick his overleveled ass into the steel dirt beneath us and move on. Moxie thanks me personally with a... a... uh... What the fuck is this? What is this? I already own this. You know what? Fuck Moxie. Fuck her boobs. Not like that. I'm moving on for good. I'm a brand new man-robot thing. And by new man robot thing, I mean I'm the same. I'm sorry, Moxie. Please forgive me for my sins. Sadly, I have to move on without her forgiveness. So the rest of this run will be completed in total unhindered depression. Thankfully, another one of the best characters ever arrives to make the remainder of this game awesome. Because absolutely nothing happens to her at all. She's alive and healthy for the rest of this video. <laughs> yeah. Now that we are on Athenus, I believe it is time for Craig to get a bit of a makeover. He now gets a shotgun and can ram into people. Let's go, Craig. I'm proud of you, buddy. Traveling with Maya does have its downsides, however, such as when this happens. 
I'm not even sure what happened. All I know is that I hate it, and I feel a strange sense of violence towards whatever that amalgamation of flesh and, and blue really is in the top right of my screen. Ugh. But, inevitably, all things must come to an end, and we travel on without Maya. I'm gonna miss you. Also, inevitably, all things must ruin your existence. I'm just gonna skip all of this. Nothing good happens whenever Ava is on screen or in the story. I sure hope she doesn't find herself in a key moment later on that completely alters the community's perception of her because it is entirely her fault what happens. That'd really suck for her character, wouldn't it? <laughs> I bust Cap and Taunt's ass and sneak my way into the Holy Temple of Maya, blessed be her name, to obtain a key or something. Hopefully it's a key to whatever closet I'm going to use to lock Ava away from the world for the rest of her life. Back on Sanctuary, I find myself slicing Lilith in half with my projected shield as Reese spouts a confession about knowing the guy who has the ultimate secret key to the greatest porn catalog in the universe or something. I think he said like 15 terabytes. I wasn't paying attention. Uh-oh. Things are a little fucky-wucky back on Promethea, it seems. Reese is having an eternal argument with some dude named One Side Junior. That sounds like a fast food meal, honestly. I'd like a Mick One Side Junior, please. Anyway, we're going to an asteroid or the moon or something. It's a pretty cool place. Good thing I'm a robot or else I might have required an Oz kit. Actually, I take it back. I take everything I said about this place back. I thought this place was cool, but suddenly I get attacked by the everlasting and eternal darkness from the void itself coming to swallow me for my sins. I'm not sure what the hell happened, but that darkness came at me like a Dementor in an underpass. Several running sections, gunning sections, and a Reese ball later, I find myself in the employ of death in his anti-robot sphere bylaws. Craig is the silent wind in the dark, ready to wreak havoc on all who dare- Oh wow, Katagawa balls actually dying pretty fast. <laughs> Well, that's done and over with. Let's go. After collecting Katagawa's porn collection, Reese admits he has a perfect rendition of the original Hebrew Bible. I'm not sure why this is important to obtain for our current mission, but Lilith, trusting Reese in everything that he says and does, sends us on our way regardless. She's the commander, I guess. So we run and run and run, ignoring pretty much everything that comes our way until we reach Reese's sick looking office. It appears Mr. One Side the Second was mildly upset that we were so bold as to destroy one of his sacred mechanical testicles. If I had a nickel for every sacred mechanical testicle I destroyed, I'd have one, because I only did it once. But, if I had a nickel for every sacred mechanical testicle and freakazoid cosplaying weirdo I destroyed, I'd have six nickels. One for the only testicle, one for Katagawa, and four for... no important reason that shall be discussed here. The fight ended up being tough only because Mr. Shiny Testicle had a shield bar and the sheer, embarrassing monstrosity that is the Ion Loader AI is painfully inaccurate at doing anything. But well, I'm still talking about this run, so I won easy-ish as pie-ish. However, this next part is a lot less easy-ish as pie-ish and more annoying-ish as shit-ish. It's vault time, baby. Not the great vault, but perhaps an all right vault in comparison. But what needs to happen first is the slow realization that I cannot make my own way through this part. I have to allow Maya to shoot and destroy things. She is AI, so it does count for the run. However, what makes it difficult is that she doesn't actually shoot or kill like anything except for doors and maybe the occasional vehicle. And by occasional, I mean like two out of like, oh, however many you're attacking. So I have to get out of the ticking time bomb that is Project DD in order to shoot and kill things. And of course, instead of me shooting and killing things, I'm talking about Craig. This isn't the most annoying part of the game, so I survive it thanks to Craig and his smart thinking simulation. He decides to go vehicle mode for me and just skate around on the ground. Actually, either he's simulating intelligent thinking or he's mocking me for not being able to drive around and kill things right now. Repeat that process for like three more areas and we make it to the first non-vehicle section here. Playing through this part felt a lot easier than every other time I've played through it. Not that it really matters to our current predicament of having to fight a vault monster, but I thought I'd let you all know because every aspect of my previous experiences matter to this current playthrough, obviously. Usually what can happen is you kill the goat faxer really fast, like this. Right now, however, I have to fight him like this.
And it goes on for a while, but afterwards, Tannis shows us that she's a siren, because only sirens have ever been able to speak through the, the consciousness of the Vault Hunter. How in the fuck did Gearbox writers think we'd fall for something as stupid as I'm testing technology? Haha, <laughs> lol. You'd think Tannis would have already had this technology if it was possible and given it to literally everyone except using it herself. Plus, Lilith didn't have her powers anymore, so how could Tannis test technology based off of Lilith's powers if she didn't have them anymore? It doesn't make any sense. That's all I'm saying. It doesn't make any sense. Then next up, I get to leave the vault with everyone all together. Maya thanking me for helping her take down the Rampager. She's just... She's just asleep right now, that's all. Up next is Eden 6, and it's a, it's a pretty big slog, so we'll speed through it pretty quick here. After fighting off a bunch of verified Twitter users, we have to go and save Sir Hammerlock. Then I tiptoe my way all the way over to the anvil, meet up with Brick, Mordecai, and Rigby, and manage to successfully deliver a pizza 30 minutes later than it should have arrived. I even got paid for it, too. Also, Hammerlock is freed, I, I guess. After that, I vroom over to and through the Jacobs estate, take care of a particularly lethal dose of being British, and finally come face to face with a, uh, well, some sort of circular disc, maybe, I think. It has a bunch of grooves in it. It even has a name on it. Seems to play sound of some sort. I'm unsure what this could be. I was born in the 90s. Back to Jacobs and Hammerlock, then to Clay and his cocaine on Reliance, I mean his Reliance on cocaine. Can you take a guess as to what happens when I take one step into the town of Reliance? I liberate the town. Everybody runs in fear of Craig, terrified by his monstrously unstoppable robot everything. Next, I have to partake in the American pastime of freeing a gunmaker from a tyrannical and insane regime before finally heading over to the Family Jewel. And here is where we meet Balex, who I sincerely hope is a Vault Hunter in Borderlands 4 because he is dope. Amazing. Awesome. Incredible. The best character to ever be introduced to Borderlands 3. I also find my first TDR weapon that I was super excited to find. Finally, I have reached TDR Nirvana. I have a gun that runs around and shoots for me when I reload. The Lord of Loot hath spoken, and he hath spoken. Fear me, Flack and Craig. The remainder of this game now grants me the ability to enjoy firefights, and boss fights, and everything in between, all at the cost of an entire clip worth of ammunition. At the end of the hit TV show of Who Wants to Be the Better AI, Balix comes out on top, then we have to finally retrieve the vault key. The game requests that we fight alongside three different rogue agents for Clay West Forest. These portions are laughable in comparison to what Craig and I have already had to deal with. I should also mention that I've successfully upgraded Craig to become a warlord. I can now collect grenade mods. Since Craig has gone through the Vietnam War, the Korean War, World War II, everything. Just don't ask him about World War I. Basically, Craig steals my grenades and throws them for me. Then comes the fun part. I have to obtain the vault key, which I'm sure you don't care for any of the boring parts that I endure on my way to the Aurelia boss fight. I thought the Aurelia part would turn me into a monster, man behind the slaughter style, but it only took me about four minutes to do so. It turns out that ice is not very effective against a robotic exoskeleton. Unfortunately, it seems ice is also not very effective against ice, or else I would have been able to take her out quicker. An unfortunate timing for my cryo sentry sprinter gun boy. Then we have to come to an almost standstill as we fight the only vault monster that truly gives me issues. Like, everything issues. In this fight, I learned that you cannot have your pet target the orb appendage, the spawner appendage, nor the critical zone on Grave Ward's dumbass plant chest. Not to mention that my sick ass TDR best friend doesn't have a long range, so it can't target him or hit him. And the suicide guns I picked up don't either. Oh, also, since the Grave Ward moves the floor, I can't put my auto shooty guns close enough to get them in range. On my first and entirely experimental attempt, I manage to drag him down to about half of his health before he proves that he's had enough. He turns me into a cliff racer without any remorse, and I fly so high, the game reads me as dead and kills me. $8,000 for an unwarranted first class trip to wherever the Grave Ward wanted to send me. Worst flight ever. On the second attempt though, it works thanks to the Jojo reference, and we manage to kill the vault creature, so Cryrene Copelipso can't absorb it. Tannis gets super kidnapped, which is like being regular kidnapped, but by superpowers, so we have to go and find her. Guess what? Luckily, she's back on Pandora. Crazy, right? If only she had been taken to any other planet with this insane teleporting power that can transcend extreme planetary distance, perhaps the Calypsos would be the victors. And yeah, I get it's because the Great Vault is on Pandora. Speaking of the victors, let's talk about someone winning a golden truck that I must steal. Too bad I have to give it up for a while as I blast my way through a murderous version of Electric Forest. <laughs> Yay. Unfortunately, I don't have a shock weapon to make that joke as true and real as it could be. Honestly, this part of the game is pretty fun, which is an amazing thing because the next part of the game is pretty opposite of fun. So opposite of fun, in fact, that I can feel the tips of my fingers going numb with how often I have to get into the truck, get out of the truck, 
boost the truck, reload, run around, shoot the ground, reload again, run around, get into the truck, get out of the truck, boost the truck. Basically, my patience wears thin pretty quickly, and yet, for some reason, I don't break my rules, despite the game throwing every opportunity at me to do so. Usually, you drive around out of the truck and break everything you have to before you go in, into carnivora, right? Well, what I have to do, since I can't force Craig to target the fuel lines or the transmission, is start chasing the carnivora, cry myself into a fit of pure rage and anger, and then shoot at the ground before throwing every weapon I can at the fuel lines. Since my guns will shoot while they fly, that I just, I just sort of throw my gun toward the fuel lines, and if it just so happens to hit it, awesome, if not, boohoo. That's the sound of me actually seething. 40 entire minutes of nothing but staring at the dull orange sands of Pandora and driving after a giant festival tank? I wouldn't be surprised if Pain and Terror started mocking me for not knowing how a gun works in the first place. Because everything that I displayed here certainly proves that I have no fucking clue how it does. This 40 entire minutes also included me driving around trying to find any boxes full of ammo to continue my voyage of self-induced pain. Thankfully, I had enough ammo on the map to deal with the carnivora fight. Otherwise, I would have cried. You can't prove that I didn't already, so there you go. Now that I am inside and no longer have to worry about the dangers of allergies, I can finally enjoy the long-ass not-driving sequence. However, as I end the shooter half of the Looter Shooter formula, another boss fight remains within my path. Thankfully, this boss fight isn't Grave Ward again, but unthankfully... No, actually, I don't, I don't think I have an unthankfully. This boss fight is pretty straightforward, it's just the Agonizer core that really proves to be a bitch because of how difficult it is to get Craig to target that damn thing. Oh, and by the way, Tannis is a siren? <laughs> Surprise, right? Oh wait, I said it earlier. Okay, well. But next up to bat, it's time for a scavenger hunt. Tannis, luckily, is the cheat sheet. She doesn't just have it, she is the cheat sheet. This cheat sheet involves a siren power enhancing unit that enhances Tannis' siren powers to 2016 meme levels. Ear rape and deep fried every, you know. Everything was deep fried, everything was ear raped, your ears weren't safe. I'm pretty sure a whole generation of kids got tinnitus because of that bullshit trend. Before I can take the machine back, I have to actually get the machine out of where it's at. And of course, going through the mine, I feel like I'm mining diamonds. Thankfully it's not night outside, otherwise I would have to <laughs> go back home and sleep for a bit. One thing is I didn't know you could actually melee the tubes holding it up, but shooting it, meleeing it, whatever, it's not an enemy so I didn't break the rules. It's time for the mega driving event. I have to constantly get out of this damn thing to deal with all of the little scabby shitters trying to force me to break the run rules. Not today, fuckers. I'm battle hardened enough for this as it is. I've been through the hardest of areas and the easiest of areas. I have the greatest of power and energy behind me. And his name is Craig. So yeah, we make it thanks to Craig and his limitless energy. Tannis does her siren thing with her siren powers and siren tattoos. Apparently this whole time the Calypso's planned on using Troy's newly acquired Maya powers to drag Elpis into Pandora to open the Great Vault? Huh, I never would have thought. That's wild. Anyway, now that the useless information is out of the way, time to kill Troy. Eventually. Eventually. I have to first go through the weirdo drug trip they call a Sanctum. It's the first time I've ever been on such a weird drug trip. And I guess it's pretty weird even for a drug trip too. Lots of metal and murder. <gasps> is this place like what bath salts feels like? I come face to face with Troy the Calypso twin number Parasite turned Siren. I just gotta get my head in the game and me and Craig end up to be all in this together. His powerful new Siren lifestyle is quickly ended through Craig's benevolent means. Wow, that was, that was pretty quick. <laughs> oh, and Shithead gets Maya's abilities for some reason, not like she earned them. Should have been Craig. Craig would have made a great Siren bot. We are not done here though, we have one more twin to take care of. And now we are invited to the grand reopening of Necrotefeo Land. Not to be confused with Necrotefeo World. It's a pretty common misconception that the two are the same. And once we are there, the first thing we have to do is talk to the shortest non-psycho alive. Or maybe he is a psycho. He chose to open this place as a theme park filled with murderous costumed people. That's not exactly the most sane thing to do. Between here and the end of the planet, nothing of note happens. So here are the spark notes for the test later, free of charge. 1. I find Vault. 2. Then Vault Key. 3. I take Vault Key. 4. I get Gun Gun. 5. Gun Gun no matter to me. 6. We go to Big Smart Red Place. 7. Can't read it. Craig no teach me reading. 8. Typhon die. 9. Tyrene stop plan. 10. Go back Pandora. Tannis opens a portal directly to the Destroyer's Rift, which is a special location where a rift was torn open by Tannis, so we didn't have to go through more padding like we were a prostitute banging the football team right after a game. 
Tyrene intends to become Commandant Steel. History repeats itself. I could make a bad taste joke about women too. Ah, fuck it, I will. The Destroyer, Eater of Stars, Destroyer of Universes, was awakened by women both times. That just goes to show you how unhinged they really are. But the fight begins and Craig proves to be ever ruthless in his efforts to overcome all flesh in the knowable and unknowable universe. I also picked up an NFT gun that burns the planet's atmosphere by 0.4% for every one piece of ammo I expend. It also acts like a turret when I reload it, so I just got a portable board monkey generator. But ultimately, I decide perhaps I should sue Gearbox for false advertising. Tyrene is labeled the destroyer, but she didn't destroy anything. Not me, not Craig, not even the entire universe like she promised. With a final snap of the fingers and a shotgun blast from Craig the God King, Tyrene turns to dust and half of the population of the universe is now a dustbin. Lilith gets her powers back, you know, emotional moment and all that. I'm a robot, so I can't feel emotion. I think Craig was crying though, that's kind of weird. She dire hawks the moon Elpis to stop it from crashing into the world's largest litter box and I, technically, beat Borderlands 3 using only Craig and the game's AI. To celebrate my victory, I shall dub my NFT gun Brock Chain. Yes, Craig and Brock Chain, a lovely duo. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like and a comment and a subscription and a share and in every other YouTube thing. I appreciate any support you throw my way. If you made it to the end of the video, leave a random timestamp in your comment for no other reason than to confuse anyone else who ever starts to watch this. And they'll understand if they watch it all the way through first before clicking the timestamp. My name was Jack. It always has been. Remember. Ava is a fucking bitch. I hate her so much. She's a pointless character that does nothing good during the story and she has no reason to even be a person in Borderlands lore. If Gearbox makes a Borderlands 4 <sighs> and she's the siren character we play as, I'll be so lucky. angry. In fact, this game proved that Maya had some powers beyond what we saw.